should be good. Okay, you should be getting that prompt now that we're going to start recording. All right. All right, well, Erica's getting her screen set up. <laughs> if we haven't met before, everybody, my name is Christine Gelly. I'm an extension educator uh, in Noble County, and Farm Talk Breakfast is a program we offer once a month, usually in person with breakfast, but Zoom will do for the time being. We vary the topic of this program just based on what's timely and what's interesting. And for today's topic, we are talking about growing oyster mushrooms at home. And our special guest is Erica Lyon. And Erica is the extension educator in Jefferson and Harrison counties. So our neighbor to the north and she has a background in fungi. So she's given a few mushroom talks already this fall and she's gonna share uh, some of her experiences with us. So Erica, I turn it over to you, take it away. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, as Christine said, um, my background is working with fungi. I uh, graduated from the University of Maine with my master's in ecology and environmental science, but really my focus was on uh, plant pathology and mycology. So I did a lot of work with plant, um, fungal diseases in low bush blueberry fields. So today I'm going to talk about oyster mushroom production. Uh, before I get started, I do want to share a video because I'm worried if I talk too long, I might not get to it. And I do want you guys to see how to start your own mushrooms in a bucket at home. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully this works this time. And if the sound's not coming through, just let me know. So far, it looks good, Erica. Good? Yep, yep. over a few of the supplies that you would need to create your own oyster mushroom production at home kit, uh, essentially using a five gallon bucket. So here I have my five gallon bucket. Uh, this one came with a lid, so you want to make sure that you have that lid as it's important. Uh, I dr drilled in uh, about half inch diameter holes uh, throughout the bucket, uh, usually somewhere between 15 to 20 uh, holes that are made in a five gallon bucket will work fine. Uh, this bucket is also food grade, which will be important anytime you grow something in a bucket, you want it to be food grade. So this is essentially the drill bit I used. And then also, you, you don't really have to have an expensive drill. Uh, any cheap one from the store will work just fine. Uh, a few other things that you will need, of course, is going to be the spawn. Uh, this one here I purchased was, is grain spawn. Uh, you can see that the mushroom um, or the fungus is growing well throughout that. That's what you want to see. Uh, if I got this in the mail and it had green splotches all over it, uh, then I probably wouldn't want to use that for my inoculation. I would contact the company to return it. Uh, but these bags usually come with a filter on the top as well. That's important. You need some air in those bags before you use them. If you get spawn in the mail uh, and you're not going to use it immediately, you can store it for a short amount of time in the refrigerator. Make sure that you check the manufacturer specifications so that way you can determine how long that spawn will last before you absolutely have to use it. A few other things that I have is we're going to use pasteurization method for this uh, example that I'm going to do. Uh, one thing that I would recommend is you don't necessarily have to have food grade weights. You can use something like a rock or a brick. Um, just make sure you know where it came from. Uh, but you're going to need that to weight this down in the pot. For this, I bought a 20 quart pot that will be used to pasteurize my straw, or in this case I'm going to be using hay, uh, as my media for that fungus to grow on. I want to fill that pot with water, uh, and then I'm going to want to make sure that I have a thermometer to measure the temperature, because remember we want 
for pasteurization, temperature has to get up to a certain point to kill off most of those organisms that might become competitors later on. Uh, I'm also going to be using pillowcases in this situation. Uh, you can use something like a burlap bag uh, to put the straw in when you put it in the pot. You don't want to put the media directly into the pot. Uh, it really should be placed in something. So in this case we're going to be using pillowcases. I'm going to be using twine to tie off those pillowcases uh, once they're done after we let that bag of media cool. Uh, and of course throughout the process make sure that you're practicing good sanitation. Uh, I have here alcohol that I'm going to use to make sure that my hands are clean as well as the surfaces that will come that media will come in contact or that spawn is clean. The first step of this process is to fill the 20 quart pot up to two thirds of the way full with water. Two full and when you add your media, which in this case is going to be the alfalfa mix hay, the water will overflow. Not enough and the hay will become will not become completely submerged and some sections won't get up to the correct temperature for pasteurization to occur. In the sink on the right is a pillowcase containing hay that has already been pasteurized and is in the process of draining. Prior to using the sink, it was sanitized before any of the supplies came into contact with it. Once water has been added to the pot, move the pot to the stove and set the temperature on the highest setting. While I waited for the water to boil, I added the hay to the pillowcase. The hay used here is an alfalfa blend. It is higher in protein and nitrogen, which oyster mushrooms love. But the downside to using hay over straw is the cost. Straw is often cheaper to attain than hay. Ideally, this hay would have been blended with straw, but hay is what I have on, the, on hand at the moment. I didn't fill the entire bag, just enough to fill about half of the five gallon bucket and for the bag to be completely submerged in the pot with the weights. For a five gallon bucket, I needed two pillowcases of hay. Whichever material you decide to use, just make sure it is permeable so the water does come into contact with the media. Once the pillowcases are filled, they were tied off with twine. Once the water begins to boil, check the temperature to make sure it is up to a minimum of 170 degrees Fahrenheit. I then added one of the bags to, of hay to the water and weighted it down with the food grade weights. As you can see here, unfortunately the weights were not enough to hold down the hay. I ended up filling another pot of water and placing it on top of the hay to completely submerge it. Make sure that the thermometer is reading the temperature in the middle of the pot. I noticed that the weight of the bag was sometimes causing the end of the thermometer to come into contact with the bottom of the pot. The temperature there might be at the level that you want, but in other areas of the pot can be cooler, especially closer to the surface, and cause sections of the hay not to get up to the temperature necessary for pasteurization. During this process, the temperature remained between 170 and 200 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the pot. This hay was heated this way for two hours. After two hours had passed, the pot was removed from the stove and placed in the sink. You may need to wait a few minutes for the top of the bag to cool off. In this case, once the weights were removed, the end of the bag just floated to the top of the pot and I was able to fish it out with a clean pair of tongs. I pulled the bag of hay out and placed it into the adjacent sink, which you actually saw earlier in this video. The water was then drained from the pot, refilled, and placed back onto the stove for the second pillowcase of hay. Once finished, both bags were left in the sink overnight to cool. It's important to remember that the temperature of the hay needs to drop for inoculation, otherwise you risk killing the fungus that you want to grow. The following day, I began layering hay and spawn in the bucket Check moisture of the hay before placing into the bucket to make sure that there is enough water. Essentially, when you squeeze a handful of hay, some water should come out in a few drops, but it shouldn't be drenched, nor should it be dry. The inside of the bucket was cleaned with 70% isopropanol and dried prior to use, and I also sanitized my hands before handling the spawn. Oyster fungi are one of the best mushrooms to begin with because they can outcompete many other organisms that will feed on the media. That said, it is still best to be as clean as possible to avoid contamination. About half a pound or 10 to 20 percent of bucket volume of spawn should be adequate for the bucket method. I'm using more than this in the hopes that colonization will be fast enough to show you a finished product, 
but this amount of spawn is not very cost effective under normal circumstances. With each layer, be sure to pack down the media. For straw and hay, you want to pack it down as much as possible. Too many air spaces might make it more difficult for the fungal threads to grow in between the media or hay particles. This means more energy is spent on vegetative growth than on fruiting, and packing reduces these spaces. Keep layering until the bucket is full, then add the lid. Also, if you notice I am doing this on carpet, you can see that it creates a bit of a mess covering the floor. Uh, so covering the floor before beginning this process will help reduce that mess and make it easier to clean afterwards. Here is what your oyster bucket should look like once it is filled. It will take about two to three weeks to colonize and an additional week to fruit or produce mushrooms. I have a humidifier set up behind the bucket to maintain humidity should it become too dry. Ideally, buckets should be incubated at 77 or around 77 degrees Fahrenheit. However, this room is currently variable between 74 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, so growth might slow slightly in this situation. It is now 10 days after the hay has been inoculated with spawn, and you can see that colonization is going well. We only see white mycelium growing in the hay. If we have blue, green, black, or any other discoloration, it would indicate that we have a contamination issue that may have come from the media not being properly pasteurized or too much moisture occurring in the bucket. Luckily, oysters are more forgiving than other cultivated mushroom species. Okay, so that was, um the first part of that video. Unfortunately, I didn't have the mushrooms ready in time by Farm Science Review, but I was able to get a time-lapse video put together uh, for how those uh, fungi or mushrooms developed after. So we'll go ahead and share this. Christine, can you see that okay? Yes, it looks great. And that video played really well on my end. Okay, awesome. So. So here we have development. Uh, here's the pinning stage. This is probably the most critical stage that you have to keep an eye on these uh, oyster mushrooms for. You, you're more likely to encounter um, abortions occurring at this phase when humidity levels are not kept high enough. But they grow pretty quickly. Uh, when I was doing this time lapse video, I was taking photos every hour and there was significant movement, movement within that hour. Um, they were fully ready for harvest at the end of about five, between five to seven days. All right. So are Just you guys- a reminder for everyone, in the, in the chat box, there is a link for a survey for Erica's teaching today. Um, so if everybody would um, please complete that survey, it's very helpful for us completing our end of the year evaluations. Um, and if you don't have access to the chat box, feel free to um, send me an email or I can send an email out to everyone that's registered with the link as well. Okay. That looks great, Erica. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, I put it in the chat box first because i that's, I'm always guilty of forgetting at the end to remind everyone to do the evaluation. Um, all right, so are you seeing presenter view or the actual slides? I see the actual slides. Okay, great. All right, so you saw in that video uh, an easy way to grow mushroom, uh, oyster mushrooms at home. Um, as I mentioned before, oysters are one of the easier ones to grow at home. Uh, you can try the, uh, the bucket method for something like shiitakes, but likely you're, you're going to have more of a challenge uh, getting those uh, fungi to grow indoors. So before we dive into mushroom cultivation um, or oyster mushrooms in general, I first want to talk about fungi. So fungi are organisms that have a lot of diversity. They range in size from very small to very large. So you've got your fungi that you might find, say, on your bread uh, in the refrigerator or strawberries. Those are usually um, fungi that might belong to a genus like mucor which they kind of look like these really cool balloons if you look at them under a microscope or a magnifying glass. 
Uh, you might also have fungi that are very large in size. For example, one of the largest organisms on Earth is a species of uh, armillaria, which is a, a close relative of the honey mushroom, and it can grow over two kilometers wide. Now, of course, you're not going to go out into the forest and find a two kilometer wide mushroom. Much of that growth is developing underground or on that substrate that it's uh, feeding on. It is estimated that there are about 1.5 million species of fungi, and as I mentioned before, a lot of diversity within this group. So what makes a fungus a fungus that we need to keep in mind when we are cultivating these species? Well, first of all, fungi reproduce through spores and not seeds. I sometimes get asked the question, what exactly is the difference between a spore and a seed? Well, of course, seeds are produced by plants, Spores are produced by fungi, ferns. Um, spores are different in that they don't have a seed coat and they don't have the embryo. They have the genetic material and then they're made of uh, some substances, uh, mostly chitin, that helps protect that spore. Um, but very much like seeds, they are a unit of reproduction and they are the products of sexual reproduction. Uh, when you're cultivating mushrooms, uh, Sometimes it's similar to what you would see with, say, someone wants to grow an apple tree from seed. You have to be careful because if you grow an apple tree from seed, even though it might, that seed might have come from a Granny Smith apple, it's not necessarily Granny Smith apples that you're going to end up getting. And it's very similar when you're cultivating mushrooms from spores. You can do it. You just don't know what those traits are going to be when those mushrooms are produced. So it, we usually recommend not uh, starting from spores, but purchasing spawn from a, a well-known supplier. Uh, fungi are also heterotrophic. That means much like us, they have to digest their food. They don't get it from sunlight. Uh, and what's different from us is that they do external digestion. So they excrete enzymes that break down that material that they then uh, take in through their hypha. So hypha are a, well, I should say hyphae, are a common uh, term that you will hear of. They're essentially this filamentous-like uh, structures that grow throughout a substrate and are the main way that fungi grow and develop. Uh, when you get a bunch of hyphae together or hypo mat, you'll end up hearing the term mycelium being used. So that's what we mean when we say mycelium. Uh, the mushroom that you see is made up of mycelium. Uh, I already mentioned that fungi contain chitin, much like the spores, that chitin can be found in the hyphae as well. Um, many are unicellular, like our yeast that we use in baking. Uh, a lot, well, I should say all of the mushroom species that we will encounter for the macro fungi are multicellular. And they are usually immobile. Uh, there are a few exceptions, hence the usually. Uh, slime molds, which are not actually true fungi, but are oftentimes grouped with fungi. If you watch them sometimes, they will move about on a surface. And then you ha also have chytrid fungi that have flagella that can swim about. Uh, fungi have pigments to protect against UV and predation. A lot of times this is why you see fungi of a variety of different colors. Purples, reds, oranges. Uh, these are all there to help protect against that um, UV and predation. Uh, however, you're not gonna find a green mushroom or a green in terms of what a plant would look like and that's because they do not have chloroplasts and they do not have chlorophyll because they do not need to photosynthesize the food. Remember, they're obtaining it from the substrate they're growing on. All right, so there's a lot of jargon on this page. I'm going to explain it the best I can. If you're thinking about getting into commercial production ever, you, ever, um, you want to make sure that you understand this process. Uh, growing at home, it might not be as important, but it is kind of helpful to know the background of what's going on as that uh, fungus is developing. So here, say we're walking out in the woods, we encounter a mushroom. It's usually growing on a log, a stump, maybe on the soil. Uh, when mushrooms are mature, they produce spores. So spores are developed, they're usually wind dispersed or air dispersed. Uh, you'll get a spore that lands on a substrate, or in this case, we have a stump here. Uh, 
um, it needs a spore from another individual um, mushroom or fungus of the same species nearby. So when you get those spores together, they will germinate, form hypha. Those hyphae will grow together and fuse in a process called plasmogamy. So plasmogamy is pretty much, you have these hyphae with two nuclei. The genetic material hasn't yet swathed yet, so sexual reproduction hasn't technically occurred, but this is the first phase of that process. You have to have plasmogamy to occur in order to get pinning to initiate. So once you have this fusion, that fungus is going to continue to grow throughout that substrate. It will not produce mushrooms until that substrate is fully colonized. It will not colonize just a quarter of it and then start producing mushrooms. You have to wait a whole period of time for that. Uh, then we have the pinion stage. Uh, I mentioned before uh, in that video that pinion is probably the most critical time that you really have to pay attention to that environment that those fungi are growing in. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have those um, mushrooms abort or pretty much they'll just they'll develop into pins and they won't develop any further. Uh, once pinning occurs, you're going to have continual development of that mushroom fruit or that fungus's fruiting body or what we call the mushroom. Uh, and this is when those nuclei fuse together, swap genetic material, and this is when we see sexual reproduction occurring. Um, fungi will produce fruiting bodies when they're under stress. So that's important to know, especially when you're talking about fungi like uh, shiitakes. Uh, shiitakes usually have to be forced to fruit if you want additional flushes of mushrooms. So we cause that by creating stress for that fungus, and that's what forces it to produce those fruiting bodies. And that's because it's trying to get as much different genetic material out there into the environment as it can. So now let's talk about the oyster. Uh, oysters get their name because they resemble a shucked oyster. Uh, they are considered to be saprobic, which means that they are found usually on decaying organic matter, a lot of times uh, wood. Some species depend on a particular tree, but most tend to be generalists. Um, one of the more common ones that you'll encounter is Pleurotus austriatus, and that's because uh, the tree, Pleurotus austriatus is the tree oyster that is actually native to North America. So you can actually go out into the wild and find wild oysters. There are a variety of strains available. You might hear the term cold weather versus warm weather. Uh, those are related to the temperatures that they're grown at. And if you're growing fungi outdoors, you can take advantage of those uh, different strains to have mushrooms uh, year round, or no, well, I shouldn't say year round because you won't get them in the winter time, but from spring through fall. Uh, oysters tend to be pretty high in protein, uh, 15 to 30% of their dry matter uh, is considered to be protein in a lot of different species and strains. So some of the common characteristics that you want to look for in oyster mushrooms, they produce a white spore print. So spore print is done by taking the cap of that mushroom, putting it face down or the gills face down on a sheet of paper. Um, I like to use a combination of white and dark paper so that way if um, I on one, at least one of them, the spore print will show up. Uh, oysters will have a stalk that is either small or lacking. Uh, it's oftentimes lateral or off-center, but it's usually very stubby. And with the tree oyster, sometimes it's a little hair. It appears a little bit hairy. Uh, oysters in general will uh, form in shelving, will have a shelving formation. You will not find a solitary oyster mushroom. They're usually growing in clusters. Uh, they have a thick fruiting body, but even though they're thick, they are fairly delicate, especially if you're trying to grow the golden oyster, it tends to crumble fairly easy. So you have to be very careful when handling it. Um, but the nice thing about oysters, they are fast growing uh, compared to some of the other ones. Uh, general oyster trends in the U.S., uh, we have seen an increase in interest in growing oysters. Uh, there has been an increase in consumer demand since the 1990s. Uh, from 2017 to 18, the USDA estimated that the total value of sales was about $106 million, with, which is an increase of 2% from that previous reporting period of 2015 to 2016. 
And the average price received for these mushrooms were about $4.06 per pound. Of course, there's some regional variation uh, depending on where you're selling them, uh, but that's usually about 20 cents, plus or minus 20 cents. Uh, one thing that I will say, if you're thinking about getting into commercial uh, production, make sure that there's a market in your area, uh, especially with oysters. Um, for example, a lot of folks around here who grow them will sell in Pittsburgh, um, but they won't sell at the Steubenville Farmer's Market because it's hard to get people to want to buy that. Uh, oyster mushrooms, very much like other uh, fungi in the group of fungi that we call the basidiomycota, they produce spores on basidia. And why am I bringing up this? Uh, well, it's mainly that oyster mushrooms produce a lot of spores when they mature. So you want to make sure that you harvest them at the right time. Uh, if you don't, they're going to accumulate spores. They're going to have a high spore load. And of course, that's going to get into the air. And that can become a health issue. If you breathe in too many of these spores, you're going to have some respiratory issues. So harvesting is generally recommended when the uh, cap edges are still a little bit curled, but they haven't completely flattened out yet. Um, but you want to try and harvest before spore production occurs. So oyster mushrooms in general are found worldwide. When I say oyster, I'm actually referring to a group of fungi of different species that are used, commonly used for culinary purposes. So the first one I mentioned was Chlorodus austriatus, or the tree oyster. That one is native to North America. Uh, we also have Chlorodus pulmonarius, which is the phoenix oyster. Um, that one is very similar to the tree oyster. They're, very, they're almost indistinguishable. The difference is that the phoenix oyster does not produce as large of clusters. It usually has maybe somewhere between three and five um, mushrooms compared to the tree oyster, which oftentimes has way more than that. Uh, we also have a couple that are considered to be the pink oyster. So the pink oyster is a tropical species that um, grows really fast when the temperatures are right. The downside to pink, growing pink oysters is they do not tolerate cold at all. You cannot put them in the refrigerator because they will die off like you can with some of the other ones. And the same is true with the golden oyster. They both originate uh, from similar regions. Uh, we also have a few other uh, species. They used to be considered uh, a type of oyster or, or in that Pleurotus genus, but recent genetic work has actually placed them in other categories. However, they're often cultivated as well and considered edible. But because they're not within the oyster mushroom family anymore, I am going to skip over those ones for now. If you are collecting oyster mushrooms in the wild, uh, just make sure that you know what you're looking for. There are um, quite a few lookalikes out there. I would say in Ohio, the, the one I see most frequently mistaken for oysters is flat crap, which is the one in the lower right-hand corner. Um, a lot of times when I see it, it's got uh, a lot of insects on it, so I don't think you'd want to eat it anyways, but um, its edibility is not really well uh, determined. So we want to be careful. It's, it, it's not listed as being poisonous, but we still want to be cautious around it. So I, I don't recommend eating them. Um, we also have what we call uh, angel wings. Um, that's that Pleurocybella origins. Uh, it used to be considered a type of oyster mushroom. It's primarily found in Japan. And the reason I bring this one up is uh, this one was considered to be an edible species for a long time. And then in 2004, they had an abnormally wet, rainy season. And something changed where, we, where a bunch of people ended up reporting getting very sick. And about 70 people had died from kidney failure from eating this mushroom. And they think it's because there's an unstable amino acid that just happened to develop under the right conditions for this one. So anytime you eat mushrooms, you have to be careful uh, part of the problem was they saw an abundant, overabundance of this mushroom that year, so they think people overate it, and that's what caused that problem. So uh, that's true of any wild mushroom species. Make sure if you try any, try it in small amounts and only eat known edible species. All right, uh, 
So enough with that, we're gonna move on into oyster production basics. So there are four components that I'm going to cover. Um, after you get collect all your supplies together, you're gonna to need to treat the media, what I'll sometimes call substrate or the material that that fungus is growing on. At once you treat your media, pasteurize it or sterilize it, then you're going to inoculate it with spawn. Uh, after that, you're going to incubate it or during a process what we call the spawn run, where it's pretty much set aside, allowed to colonize. And once it's finished colonizing that substrate, then it's going to go into the fruiting phase. So just a few materials that you need in general for oysters, uh, a type of cellulose waste or agricultural byproduct. Um, a lot of times straw is used. You can use uh, wood chips from deciduous trees. Don't use coniferous um, because they don't grow on that. Uh, you can also use coffee grounds. Uh, there's been a lot of work done lately uh, with the use of coffee grounds. Um, but really you can experiment with a lot of different things. Just make sure that there's nothing that that fungus is going to end up picking up and storing in its tissues. So for example, you can grow oysters on a toilet paper roll. I would recommend saving that toilet paper roll for its actual purpose because you're not gonna be able to eat the mushrooms that grow from that because it could eat um, substances up from that toilet paper that are not considered edible. Uh, okay, so we need water. Uh, moisture is absolutely critical. Uh, if we allow substrates to get too dry, we're not gonna get mushrooms. Uh, we need equipment to cut straw. If you're thinking about going on a larger scale, uh, the one that I did with the bucket earlier, I did not chop that up, but I wasn't really looking to maximize my mushroom production. Um, but you, ideally you would want something two to six centimeters in length. Uh, and they have, Rika, uh, yep. I have a question and you may be getting to this. Do you need to re-wet the substrate in between mushroom crops. So if you harvested the first set of oysters and you were expecting regrowth, do you need to re-wet the media in between? That is a great question, Christine. Um, so what I found was in the bucket, using the bucket method, there's actually quite a bit of condensation that occurs in the bucket and it stays relatively um, moist on its own. I was able to get two flushes um, out of that without having to modify it at all. Now, when you talk about outdoor production or with mushrooms like shiitakes, you do have to uh, do an additional soak to force that fruiting to occur. Um, sometimes you can just drop the temperature and that will also force fruiting. Good question. Uh, are there any others before I move on? None in the chat so far. If, okay. if we have some, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, sounds good. Um, the other thing that we need is a boiling pot or uh, sometimes people use 55 gallon drums if you're talking more about maybe not large scale production, but if you're wanting to sell at a local farmer's market, you can oftentimes pack quite a few bags uh, into those. Uh, you'll need something to sterilize or really pasteurize uh, that media that you're working with, some sort of temperature control device for when, those, when you're storing those bags and allowing them to undergo their spawn run. Uh, a lot of times this just means simply a heater, a fan, and an air conditioning unit. Uh, we can use bags, a variety of containers are available, uh, and then some commercial producers, um, I mentioned pasteurization using, um, uh, well, essentially boiling water and then soaking that media in that. Uh, another common way to pasteurize media is to use calcium carbonate or lime treated water, do a lime soak, and that uh, pH ends up causing uh, or allows to uh, reduces competitors on that substrate. Uh, if you are collecting uh, from a wild specimen, which I would say if this is your first time doing this, uh, I would skip the culturing on your own. Um, you want to make sure you get experience with identifying oyster mushrooms first. But you can culture them on your own on potato dextrose auger or pretty much in petri dishes um, by taking some uh, interior internal tissue uh, and placing it on that petri dish and allowing it to grow. And then you would inoculate something like grain or sawdust to get your spawn growing. So when you order spawn from a uh, supplier, that's pretty much how they get that spawn going. 
Uh, I already mentioned spawn can come in a variety of forms, uh, sawdust or grain. Um, spawn pretty much just means that you're trying uh, you're trying to get that mycelium growing, developing, but you don't want it to fruit because you want it to fruit on a different substrate. It's mostly used for storage. So it's usually generated from a stored culture. Um, I mentioned before, it can be cultured through spores, but once again, you gotta watch that because you're gonna get a different strain and it's unpredictable on what characteristics or traits you're gonna encounter with that. Uh, and I, yep. We do have a, another question in the chat and I have a, a question that goes with it. Back to the water, Tammy asks, I assume you should not use chlorinated water. Um, what about well water, cistern water? Um, do those uh, particles uh, leave the water when you do the sterilization process? That's a good question. Pasteurization, so, I mean. Um, for what I was using for water, I pretty much just used what came out of my sink. Uh, you do, in some places, have to pay attention to what's in the water. Uh, they do recommend testing if you suspect that there's going to be some contamination issues with your water. In terms of chlorine, you don't have to worry about that. Um, because I'm boiling it on the stove, that water's sitting out for a while. I'm also leaving that media sitting out for a while. That chlorine's gone by the time I inoculate it with the, the fungus because we have to let it sit overnight to cool. I would say temperature is probably going to be your biggest issue if you're worried about killing off the spawn that you use to inoculate with. Good question. Okay, thank you. All right, and if you're getting started with oyster production, I do recommend that you purchase from a supplier um, rather than starting on your own. Um, you can experiment later on once you get familiar with the process of growing them, uh, collecting from wild specimens, but um, if you purchase them from suppliers, you know the traits that you're going to get. You know the general time frames that you're working with. Uh, in terms of spawn source, when you get your spawn in the mail, uh, if you're purchasing from a supplier, it should be sterile or originally sterile before it's inoculated with uh, that fungus. Uh, if you get spawn in the mail that it smells weird, it doesn't smell earthy like mushrooms do. Um, it might smell yeasty. Uh, it's probably contaminated. You don't want to use that. Uh, same if it's growing pink, green, black, dark brown splotches. That's not good. Now I mentioned in that previous video uh, that I showed early on that uh, sometimes oysters will produce an orange, orangish exudate. That's normal and they do that to reduce competition. It's, uh, an, it's an enzymatic uh, mixture that helps reduce that. So that's fine, but if you're seeing like a dark brown coloration on your oyster mushroom, that's different. That's likely bacterial contamination. Uh, and then when we get our spawn, uh, we want to make sure that we're tracking the weight of that substrate, uh, especially maybe not so much on the home growing scale, but on the commercial scale, you want to know how much of that substrate that uh, fungus is utilizing to produce how many pounds of mushrooms. Uh, some preferred substrates for mushroom production, you can grow oyster mushrooms outdoors and indoors. Indoors is preferred for oysters, unlike some of the others like shiitakes and wine caps. Uh, you can grow them outdoors on hardwood logs and stems. Once again, avoid coniferous uh, wood. Uh, I've also seen some companies grow them on raised beds and mix them in with uh, vegetable crops. So there's a variety of ways that you can uh, grow oysters outdoors. Now the time frame extends quite a bit to six to eight months to get your first fruiting. Whereas if you grow them indoors, you get fruiting occurring within three weeks. Uh, indoors, you can use a wide range of agricultural byproducts. As I mentioned before, pasteurized is ideal um, for that. Uh, when you're doing outdoor production, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because it's not usually the preferred method for growing oysters. Um, you want to encourage soil contact. This allows that log to maintain its moisture content. Moisture is going to be the most critical factor that you deal with when working with mushroom cultivation. Uh, with oysters, they naturally grow in beetle galleries in the wood. So if you can mimic this when you inoculate that uh, log, that would be best. Um, and then the benefit of growing them outdoors is that you will get fruiting occurring for two to three years after you inoculate. So you don't have to do it every year. 
Uh, you can also use a method similar to what's used for wine caps by layering wood chips and cardboard. And that's a method that you would use if you're growing them in between your vegetable crops. Uh, you can inoculate uh, with supplemented sp sawdust spawn. Uh, you'll, you want to use floating row covers though if you're working outdoors because uh, you're not the only one who wants to eat these mushrooms. Uh, a lot of times you're competing with insects and deer on occasion. Uh, floating row covers also help create the adequate conditions for mushrooms to develop, like they can help moderate uh, humidity and temperature to a degree. Uh, indoor production, you're going to want to shred uh, substrate materials. I mentioned before, uh, two to six centimeters for straw is ideal, and they do have shredders out there available for to do that specifically. And that's more of a concern, once again, if you're thinking about going into commercial production. Uh, you'll want to pasteurize any media and allow it to cool prior to inoculation. Uh, don't inoculate it as soon as it comes out of the pot because you're going to end up killing off the oyster mushroom that you, or the oyster fungus that you want to grow. And usually expect anywhere from three to five weeks for, from inoculation to fruiting. Uh, the one that I used was a species of tree oyster, and it was mature, fully mature four weeks after inoculation, and it started pinning three weeks after inoculation. That's a standard time frame. If you're growing something like the pink oyster, it will likely be closer to three weeks by the time it reaches full maturity. And that's just because it, it's a more aggressive grower. It grows really fast. Uh, container selection, uh, pretty much anything. You can grow it in about anything. Um, just make sure that it's something like polyethylene columns are pretty good. Plastic bags are probably the most common. You'll sometimes see people growing oyster mushrooms in trash bags in the basement. Um, that works well. You can also grow them in nursery pots. Uh, you want to consider surface area for gas exchange, uh, much like we need oxygen. Uh, fungi need oxygen as well. Uh, you want some gas exchange going on at the surface where mushroom production will occur. So that's why you're going to put holes in those containers. And like I did with the bu bucket where I drilled in half inch diameter holes. Uh, let's see. Avoid waste uh, as substrate costs can add up. That's uh, more of a concern if you're getting into commercial production. Of course, if you have to purchase it on a homeowner scale, uh, reducing waste can help. And that's why a lot of people use might use uh, coffee grounds. Uh, consider phototropism. Uh, which is pretty much, okay, so fungi don't need light for, to obtain nutrients, but they do use light to develop their caps. That generally the caps are always facing up towards sunlight. So you do want to have some light when you're growing your mushrooms. You don't need as much as you do for, you don't need as much of an intensity as you do for plants, um, but it is important. And consider container opacity. Uh, it's best to put holes in containers that have where you've got a limited amount of light coming through. Otherwise, you might if you use a clear plastic bag, for example, you might end up getting mushrooms that grow inside the bag, and that's going to be difficult to harvest, and you're probably going to um, cause some damage to that mushroom that might not look so appealing. So that's why we use the holes. That's why a lot of times you you see people using dark. Uh, or black trash bags. Uh, okay, so substrates for fruiting. Uh, I mentioned straw already. It can be from a variety of different straw types. Wheat, barley, rye, sunflower. Um, make sure the moisture content of that before, um, that should be actually greater than 50%. That might be a typo. Um, but straw is usually the most common one that people use, and that's because it's cheap. Uh, another one that studies have actually found that it's more efficient, um, you actually get greater yields from, are cotton seed holes, if you can get access to them. Of course, that might be a little more difficult in Ohio uh, than, say, in Arkansas. Um, soybean holes also work fairly well. Um, and the nice thing about using these holes is no chopping is required. You can just pretty much process them right away. And then there's also hardwood sawdust. Um, usually that's kind of your last option, um, but it does, it does, it will work. It just doesn't have as much uh, nutrients to it. Uh, get organized before you inoculate. Uh, 
if you are thinking about doing this regularly, you might want to have a dedicated inoculation room um, that is separate so that way you can keep it clean, uh, limit the amount of contamination that might occur. Uh, consider ergonomics. Uh, a lot of times with oyster mushrooms, you're going to be doing a lot of packing and it's kind of hard to do it at odd angles. So make sure you're doing it in a place where you're comfortable. Uh, make sure you stock your materials and have your protective equipment uh, available. Um, if you're growing a large amount of mushrooms, you might have to consider that the number of spores produced. Uh, so you might need a respirator. Uh, sanitize surfaces, equipment, and tools. And that can be done with pretty much 70% isopropanol or ethyl alcohol. Uh, pasteurization, when I say pasteurization, that pretty much means uh, treating media somewhere between 170 degrees Fahrenheit to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and the goal of pasteurization is not necessarily to kill off every single microorganism on that media substrate. It's mostly to reduce or limit the growth of competitors. And we can use pasteurization for oyster mushrooms because they grow so fast. Uh, sterilization is a little bit more of an intensive process. Uh, you have to treat media to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And the goal with that is to kill off all the organisms before you inoculate it, because these are usually used for species of fungi that are not as competitive. So good examples of this would be shiitakes and henna lizards. Do we have any questions, Christine? I saw the box flash. Tammy uh, just commented that cotton seed hulls can be found at livestock feed stores. Uh, Tammy okay. works at Heritage in Caldwell, so she has an inside hint okay, there. Great. That's good to know. Um, yeah, if you have access to cottonseed holes and they're cost effective, um, I, I would actually use those over straw. Um, that seems to be what the research indicates is you will get more um, mushroom mass that's produced. All right, uh, so for techniques, uh, for well, I should say for different pasteurization techniques, you can use the hot water immersion method, which is what I showed in that video earlier. Um, there is steam pasteurization that you would use some, for something like a 55-gallon buck uh, drum. Uh, the steam pasteurization, it takes a lot longer. It's about a 12-hour process, but the nice thing about it is you can do a lot. If you have multiple bags of media, you can do those at once. Um, and it's used primarily for compost and manure. Uh, solar pasteurization uh, is where you're not using any water or electricity at all. That usually takes about six to eight hours. Uh, and then chemical treatments such as the lime that I mentioned earlier is um, oftentimes used to adjust that pH. And a lot of commercial users, a lot of commercial suppliers will use lime to treat their media substrates. And then sterilization is usually a process that takes two hours. It requires some specialized equipment. So that's another reason why oyster mushrooms are nice. You don't have to invest in these sterilization, uh, expense, expensive pieces of equipment for sterilization. Um, just remember, whichever method you use, make sure you allow it to cool afterwards. All right, so some of these slides I'm gonna skip over just because we're running short on time. Um, when you're inoculating, um, I've already mentioned it's a labor intensive process. Uh, pretty much you're going to fill those bags, if you're using bags, you're gonna fill them to the point of stretching and pack them down as much as you can. If you think about how um, media is, um, how air spaces are in media, if you don't pack down that media enough, you're gonna have these large air spaces that these small hyphae are gonna have to cross to get to the next, uh, say, piece of straw or grain. And that's more energy they have to expand, expend to grow. And because they're wasting that energy on growth, they're not going to use it for fruiting. So that's why they say pack it down as much as you can. However, you can get it too compacted. Um, it's kind of hard to do by hand, but um, keep that in mind as well. Uh, poke holes in these containers, we already talked about the light and the gas exchange being important. And then if you're doing multiple batches, make sure to label your species strain and when you inoculated it. Otherwise, you can lose track of which bags you should expect mushrooms from and which ones are still in the process of colonization. And then it's always a good idea to use a clear container, not one that you're planning to harvest mushrooms from, but you can at least observe how that batch is doing. It, did it, is it showing any signs of contamination? 
because it's a little hard to check for contamination when you're dealing with an opaque uh, container. Uh, incubation uh, is usually done for oysters indoors, uh, somewhere around 75 degrees. It depends on what strain you get, whether it's warm or cool weather, uh, and what species you're working with. Uh, usually the golden and the pink oysters, they will, be, they will need somewhere around 80 to 85 degrees for that incubation period. Whereas something like the tree oyster is fairly flexible. It does well anywhere from 55 to 75 degrees. Uh, a lot of times the incubation, how fast it colonizes is dependent on that inoculation rate. So what percentage uh, of that spawn are you using? Um, in that video, I think I used, I wanna say it was pretty well over 20%. Um, that's a little high. Usually they say anywhere from five to 15% is a good range to shoot for of that total volume of that, in that case, you're using a bucket uh, or that container. Keep in mind these containers will heat up. You have a lot of uh, growth going on, uh, a lot of uh, breakdown of material and that generates heat. So you wanna make sure you space out your bags. Um, otherwise they're gonna heat up and they're gonna cook the chili. Uh, and then also use fans to circulate out CO2. If you just have a few bags, you don't have to worry about this. It's more if you're doing a lot at one time, CO2 might build up. Uh, monitoring heat, I already mentioned about this. Uh, you don't want to create anaerobic conditions because that will create dead zones in these bags uh, or in the containers. Um, and in these areas, you're pretty much cooking the mycelium, which you don't want to do. Uh, it also provides opportunities for thermophilic microbes to take over. I know when we talked about hay production in some of our programs, uh, we talked about the risk of fires occurring from uh, pretty much the same thing happening. So you do have to watch this. Um, Management, you can, like I said, you need a heater or air conditioner or some way to regulate that temperature if you're working indoors. Uh, fruiting is generally going to require lighting. Um, you can technically keep your, the spot, while the bags are in spot, going through that spawn run, you don't need light for that period. But as soon as they're right, as soon as you hit the three week mark, uh, it's probably a good idea to start moving them to the light so that way they can start directing uh, which direction those mushrooms will grow. Uh, humidity is oftentimes kept a little higher, especially when you're talking about the pinning phase, somewhere between 85 to 90 percent, uh, 90 percent. Some species of, um, well, some, cult of, uh, some strains of mushrooms require 95 to 100 percent humidity during that pinning phase, so make sure you read the manufacturer's specifications. They're usually pretty specific on what those requirements are. Uh, temperature, uh, 50, pretty much keeping it the same, 55 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit is common for the typical tree oyster. And then that CO2 should be kept pretty low. Um, you can grow mushrooms pretty much about anywhere. I will admit I grew that bucket um, in my back bedroom. Not sure if I would recommend that just because I would, I was paying attention to it and making sure that I harvest before spore production. Of course, you don't want to keep it back there if you're going to have a lot of spores to work with. So a lot of times it's often nice to have a separate room that you're working with. You can grow them in greenhouses, um, barns, basements are great places to grow oysters. We've already talked about lighting. Generally, you're going to need about 18 hours per day. Uh, and this can be LEDs or fluorescence, pretty much enough light to read a book. Uh, as I mentioned before, you don't need quite the intensity that you do for plants. Uh, CO2, um, you might notice if you have a CO2 problem, if you're, if you're seeing mushrooms that are forming really long stems and really small caps. And that's because if you think about how mushrooms grow uh, in the woods, a lot of times they're covered in leaf litter and CO2 builds up in that leaf litter. So they have, and they want to get their spores out into um, the wind because most, most of those spores are wind dispersed. So they have to grow taller in order to effectively disperse those spores. Um, so that's how CO2 kind of ties into it. Of course, we are not really interested in spore production when we're cultivating mushrooms. We want more, uh, more mass in the caps. So um, that's why you got to watch that CO2. Uh, if you're not seeing fruiting, it could be an indicator that those CO2 levels are just too high. 
uh, temperatures for fruiting, uh, oftentimes the mid 60s. Um, once again, that develop that depends on the strain. We kind of already talked about that. Um, biological efficiency is more. If you're thinking about uh, getting into selling oyster mushrooms, uh, biological efficiency will become important. If you're just growing them at home, you might not care too much about this, but it's pretty much the total harvested, the total amount of harvested mushrooms divided by the dry substrate weight. So say you have a five pound bag uh, of uh, substrate and it has a moisture content of 75% when you initially inoculate it. So you wanna figure out uh, what is 75% of that moisture content? Subtract that to get your dry matter, which in this case, it's 1.25 pounds uh, of dry matter. So that translates into, if we get 1.25 pounds of mushrooms harvested per bag, that's a biological efficiency of 100. And that's ideally what we want. We want higher percentages. Um, you'll even see some uh, uh, oyster mushrooms, they will have over 100% biological efficiency. Um, if you're getting something like 50% biological efficiency, then you need to do some tweaking with your growing conditions. Uh, I'm not going to talk about bottle production. It's another method that's commonly used in Japan. Um, harvesting, you'll want to harvest them one week after fruiting starts, so after pinning starts to occur. Um, you'll want to harvest prior to, just prior to the caps flattening out. Once they've uh, start to flatten, they're getting past that maturity point, they're going to be producing a lot of spores at that point. Um, and if you're producing a lot of, or you're working with multiple batches, you're going to want to harvest, plan to harvest two times per day. Uh, storing, you can store these mushrooms pretty much in the refrigerator. Uh, make sure your refrigerator is getting down to at least 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I've wrapped oyster mushrooms in paper towel and they've kept for quite a while. Um, well, quite a while usually means a maximum of 14 days. Uh, oysters tend to be on the more fragile side. They tend to um, rot a little more quickly than some of the other ones like shiitakes do. So you, you do have to make sure you use them right away and, or sell them right away. Uh, marketing, um, if you're planning to sell these at a farmer's market, make sure you flip them upside down uh, and have the gills exposed because usually most of the color is in the gills and that can attract people if they're interested in oyster mushrooms. Uh, but make sure that there is a market uh, to sell where you're at. Um, once again, like we would have a hard time here in Steubenville trying to sell oyster mushrooms, but in Pittsburgh, we know they tend to sell pretty well. All right, so um, I'm out of time, but I do wanna just quickly bring up um, one of the main things that I've noticed is bacterial contamination can be an issue if you keep humidity too high. So you actually want to drop the humidity after pinning is finished and you're seeing those uh, mushrooms get more to the mature stage. Drop that humidity, otherwise you're going to have bacterial issues. So you can see here I have an orange spot in the middle of my mushroom cap. That's usually a good sign of Pseudomonas lassi. Um, these mushrooms will become brittle, they have a reduced shelf life, um, and usually it, the cause is excess moisture. So with that, um, I am out of time, but I will take any questions that you might have. I covered a lot of material, so um, please feel free to ask if uh, you want me to clarify anything. Erica, thank you. I know I've learned a ton this morning and um, that's really, amazing that you can get a hundred percent or more efficiency out of any type of crop. Yeah, fungi are amazing. They're very efficient at extracting what they need from their substrate. Uh, just a reminder, um, if you could please uh, fill out the evaluation that is in the chat box and I think I can, let me see if I can repost it. Okay. Yep, I see so, it there. As a heads up, one is not number one. One is bad. Five is good. But if I would really appreciate it. Any feedback that you can give uh, is much appreciated. Okay, I see that uh, people are saying thank you. Great presentation.
Um, just for everybody's knowledge, the, the presentation has been recorded and it will be posted on the Noble County Extension website. Um, so if you would like to come back and rewatch the presentation, you absolutely can. We will have it posted as soon as Zoom finishes loading. And uh, Erica, could you give us your email in the chat box if people would like to follow up with more questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't go to the last slide. Uh, my, you can reach me at uh, my email, lion.194 at osu.edu. Um, or you can give me a call at 740-461-6136. Um, that's my direct line. Uh, I answer a lot of questions about mushroom cultivation, uh, mushroom identification, um, as well as other things related to fungi. So feel free to send, or plant pathology questions, feel free to send those on over. Excellent. And for those of you who are um, more local, close to Noble County, something neat is that Monroe County often offers a shiitake mushroom cultivation class. Um, they have not offered it this year due to in-person restrictions. Uh, however, that has been a really popular class that they've done uh, in the past and will likely do in the future. And they um, order everything that you need for the class and you just enroll and you come and learn how to soak and inoculate and care for the logs. So if this has uh, piqued your interest, oysters are probably a great place to start and get your feet wet with, with mushrooms. And you can do that, you know, even here during the winter. And uh, then looking forward to next year, hopefully, if things progress well, we will be able to offer more in-person programming again. Um, and we could get you the resources you need if you're interested in that shiitake workshop when it comes around again. With that, I'm going to stop the recording. If anybody would like to hang on for additional questions, feel free. Uh, Erica, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Christy.